Welcome to the next discipleship class. So today we're going to continue on with uh, the uh, David's kingdom or the Messianic kingdom, uh, where we're going with that. We've gone halfway through this particular presentation and we did the various aspects of God's kingdom. We laid that out, the meaning of the Messianic kingdom, the length, the unconditional nature of it, um, because it is covenanted uh, to David, his offspring, the Messiah, right, from God. And then the next um, aspect we're looking at here is the predictions of the Messianic kingdom. Was it anticipated? So <clears throat> we'll see there's six characteristics of the Messianic kingdom. First of all, um, there's a spiritual dimension that we'll look at, the political dimension, the ecclesiastical or religious aspect, the economic aspect, the physical dimension, and the moral dimension. So um, obviously there's a spiritual uh, piece of this messianic kingdom. Um, there's certainly the political dimension to it because uh, the Messiah will be reigning over Israel and actually the whole world. The ecclesiastical or religious <clears throat> excuse me, aspect is really more geared towards uh, what the nation of Israel will be practicing uh, during that time. The economic aspect is how the economy will work in the world during that time. The physical dimension uh, obviously is global and it is uh, Jesus will be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. And then there's certainly a moral dimension that righteousness will reign. We look forward to that time. So the earliest intimations of the Messianic reign, we see the first prophecy really of the Messiah, uh, the Savior of the world, is in Genesis 3.15, where God said to Satan, uh, because of what had happened in the fall and his tempting of Eve, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this is talking about um, <clears throat> obviously the cross uh, where Adam and Eve had lost the kingdom, the authority that they had over this world, the dominion that they were given. They lost it to Satan when they bowed down to him, uh, followed him in um in his temptation to get them to sin. Uh, so that removed their rulership and Satan became the god of this world. Answers a lot of the questions as to why things are so messed up the way they are today. So this would be the first uh, intimation or really prophecy saying that um, God was going to bring uh, one through the woman who would be human to correct the problem. Now, note, the Messiah is to be a human being who will crush the head of the serpent and thereby bring spiritual deliverance for Adam's race, as well as really redeem the whole world. Um, he will bring to conclusion through the Messianic kingdom, actually, when it arrives, everything that has been um, let go, in a sense, um, that God wanted man to have during this time on earth uh, in the book of Genesis. So, uh, it doesn't, history doesn't come to a screeching halt. History comes to a place where things are put back right that have been wronged uh, in the book of Genesis. And that's why we understand it as a literal kingdom, because um, uh, those things, as we talked about previous, need to be put together uh, to fulfill all righteousness. Genesis 9.6, right? 9.26, Noah said, Blessed be the Lord the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. So there is the, uh, through Shem, the continued line. Uh, note the Messiah was to come through Noah's son Shem and would rule over the Canaanites. Um, this was, again, prophetic of the Messianic line from Adam uh, right on through to Noah and then Shem. So, in Genesis 12, we get to Abraham or Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country um, 
and your kindred and your father's house in the land which I will show you, number one, and I will make of you a great nation, number two. Uh, that's about his descendants, so land and descendants, and I will make you uh, make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So there's going to be a messianic. Um, that is a redemptive blessing where uh, through Abraham, though it needs to be developed, this promised blessing that started in Genesis, this redemptive aspect is going to follow through, uh, through Noah, um, I'm sorry, that went through Noah, now through Abraham's line. So he'll be of Abraham's seed. Note, there was to be a messianic nation and a messianic land, which implies a messianic kingdom. Uh, and the blessing would be affecting all nations, uh, not only um, through what is happening now where the gospel is going out to the world, but also the messianic kingdom will be ruling over the whole world uh, at the return of Christ. Genesis 35, and God said to him, Jacob, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your, your own body. So this, is, this uh, promise is followed through from Abraham to Isaac, now to Jacob. Um, and then within the tribes of you know, Jacob's 12 sons, uh, the patriarchs or the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, Genesis 49, we find uh, which tribe that the Messiah is going to come through. Of the tribe of Judah, it was written, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. So this is uh, where we understand now that Judah, the fourth tribe in this list in Genesis 49, uh, this is the tribe of the Messiah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Note the Messiah is to be from the tribe of Judah, a ruler in Israel and ruler over the nations. So we see that both in that verse. Exodus 19.6, God told Israel, and again, this is after they are out of Egypt, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, this is actually where the negotiation takes place that they would obey the law. These are the words. Uh, you are to speak to the Israelites. Uh, this records the establishment of a theocracy with God as king. So we have an unconditional covenant of land, seed, and redemptive blessing uh, to Israel, right, the nation. And then we also now have, um, <clears throat> we're entering into a place where there's going to be a conditional covenant. Uh, Israel will be blessed if they obey it. Um, cursed if they disobey it, but this is the Mosaic Covenant that they need to be obedient to the law. Deuteronomy 17, talking about future kings, um, in this kingdom of priests and this holy nation um, that is really um, the initial establishment and then eventually fulfilling it in the Messianic kingdom, uh, because again, the kingdom is connected to the nation of Israel. That is the only vehicle that the that it will come to this world through, uh, which is why you can see the attacks against Israel. They're all satanic. Anti-Semitism is satanic. Um, it has a satanic root and source, so that's why Satan will always try to destroy Israel to prevent the fulfillment of this necessity. Now, in Deuteronomy 17, we learn about what God wanted for kings. Uh, Moses wrote, When you enter the land of the Lord your God is giving you, and you say, Let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. That was their desire. Be sure to appoint uh, over you the king of the Lord your God, uh, the Lord your God chooses. In other words, it's of a king of God's choosing, not the people's. He must be from among your own brothers. He has to be a Jew. Uh, when he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law. It is to be with him, and he will read it uh, all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God, follow and follow carefully all the words of this law. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. Now, <clears throat> obviously, 
This is for the temporary kings, but this also foreshadows ultimately the messianic rule when Jesus returns. So um, the copy of the word of God that the kings were supposed to be writing so that they would understand it um, and, and the way it would operate within the nation of Israel, again, we're, we're learning here not only functionally what would happen, but uh, how it necessitates Israel, again, as the vehicle that God will bring this kingdom to the earth through. That it's the reason that he established uh, Israel as a nation. Deuteronomy 15, it says, Moses forewarned Israel, if you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today, for the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised, and you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. Again, this is really only possible in the Messianic kingdom because Jesus will rule the world and the other nations. It really can't happen um, w within the structure that they were limited to prior to that. In 2 Samuel 7, <clears throat> but again, it looks forward to the Messiah who's going to rule over everybody, right? But in 2 Samuel 7, the Lord declares that um, to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you, talking to David, when your days are over and you rest with your fathers when you die, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So obviously we're talking longevity here. This is none of the kings that reigned in Israel. Um, northern or southern kingdom obviously it had to be in the south because of judah the tribe in the south judah and benjamin uh, when the kingdom was divided but however this obviously has to anticipate uh, the messiah and this is the davidic covenant that god made with david for his offspring to be the messiah uh, isaiah tells us for unto us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. He's going to be in control of it. He'll be ruling it. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, which means Father or Source of Eternity, uh, Prince of Peace. He is both deity and political leader in this kingdom, uh, not like any other ruler. He is the only unique individual in the history of, uh, of time that will ever have this position or be both God and man able to be deity and a political leader in time in the, through the nation of Israel. Isaiah 11, he wrote, In that day the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, uh, Cush, Elam, Babylon, Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. So a second time. Now, <clears throat> they really hadn't even been gathered back a first time. The first time will be from Babylon. The second time will be from their dispersion from 70 A.D., so interesting that Isaiah puts that in there. So he's determining the not only that it is the second time, but because of the scope of where they're coming from, uh, they're not just coming from Babylon, which was the first exile. Uh, May 15th, 1948, Israel was declared a nation and millions have returned from around the world. So after the 70 AD dispersion, which is prophesied in Deuteronomy, um, People started coming back to the nation of Israel, uh, probably at the end of the 19th century, turn of the century, and then uh, they were buying land and, and starting to live there. And then as they built up their nation, David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister, was there when they became a nation uh, recognized in 1948. So <clears throat> in 2020, 
Um, right now, the population of Israel, according to the CIA fact book anyways, is uh, uh, 8 million 675, uh, let's see, yeah, uh, 8675, 475 million. So 75% of them are Jews ethnically um, that live in Israel. Uh, according to the CIA fact book. So that's a very old picture of them on their uh, return way back when, initially. So Isaiah 24 says, even the center of the Messiah's reign is specified. Uh, Isaiah wrote, the moon will be uh, abashed and the sun ashamed for the Lord God Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders gloriously. So Jesus will rule and reign from Jerusalem. That's where he will reign from. Zechariah tells us in chapter 14, on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. This is on his return. And the Mount of Olives will split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north half moving south and then there'll be a river that comes out of there there actually is they've um, discovered that uh, underneath that mountain there is a uh, a spring underneath it that would obviously become a river if it cracked in two um, now he is going to return there but this is where he left acts one in the ascension uh, men of galilee they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So, again, Jesus, he rose from the dead. That's the resurrection. He ascended into heaven. Uh, that's the ascension. He is our high priest right now. That is his present session. That is the position that he has. And then... Uh, he intercedes for us so that we can pray. Um, he comes to our aid so we can be uh, successful. And then he will return again to the Mount of Olives, the same place that they saw him go. Isaiah 32, see, a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. So righteousness will characterize his kingdom. Uh, you have to have a kingdom to have one in righteousness. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gently and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this was when he presented himself on what we call Palm Sunday, and he was officially and publicly rejected by the leadership of Israel. But again, he came as the king, though he was rejected. He is to come to Jerusalem because that's where he's going to establish his kingdom. Psalm 2 says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Again, that's the location. Revelation 19, Jesus is called the king of kings and lord of lords at his second coming. So, Jeremiah 31, this is about the new covenant, right? Uh, so when he returns, the new covenant will be enacted in Israel. We benefit from that new covenant, the church. However, the new covenant is actually with the nation of Israel, though um, we understand as we get into Paul's epistles, especially in Galatians uh, and Romans, that we learn that if we have faith, then we are like Abraham, Abraham's True children are ones that have faith like Abraham, not just are genealogically connected to him. It's not through blood, it's through spirit that uh, God is looking for that likeness um, to be a true son of Abraham in that sense. So Jeremiah 31, 31, the time is coming, declares the Lord. This is when they were under the Mosaic Covenant. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, when they'll be all combined together in one nation, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Note, this speaks of the future moral and spiritual restoration of the nation of Israel in the Messianic kingdom 
through this new covenant, that they're all tied together. This has to happen. So again, we don't just, you know, go 100 miles an hour and boop, we just end um, life as we know it. And it just all becomes uh, the kingdom of heaven somewhere else. Um, these things must occur. These must be fulfilled. And they're not through the church. Ezekiel 11 says the glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain of the east. So the spirit of God actually left uh, the nation of Israel. This is prior um, as they were going in, prior to their destruction, as they were going to go into Babylon for their captivity. Ezekiel ministered to them in their captivity, explaining to them why they were there. And so he explained that, um, you know, you to write Ichabod, in other words, departed. The Spirit of the Lord had departed from Israel because God brought that judgment upon them. Even the Jewish historian Josephus records the departure of God's glory from Israel in his Jewish wars. Hosea says in chapter 3, Hosea predicted that the Israelites will live many days without a king or prince. Uh, from here on, it was a matter of prediction of a coming messianic kingdom. So the point is, is that the, um, the failure of Israel to continue to be what God wanted them to be brought them into Babylonian captivity and the Spirit of God actually departed from them. They were never really the same, even when they returned back, because they were already being predicted to not just return back into the, uh, the land initially from Babylon, but to return a second time. So <clears throat> though God knows that they would reject his son, um, he did not make them reject his son. They did that willingly as many, many verses uh, declare. But this is prophetic, anticipating and showing how the Messianic kingdom must come. And Hosea is telling us that there's going to be this period where there is no king, like, and they're not really functioning as a nation. He's letting us know that. This is really what Paul brings out in Romans um, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, why there's that gap in time and, you know, Israel does not have their king and there is no messianic kingdom. So Amos tells us in that day, uh, and this is actually uh, quoted in the book of Acts, I will restore David's fallen tent in Acts 15. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins and build it as it used to be. So again, this is Amos that is telling prior to the Babylonian captivity, but yet uh, James quotes Amos um, in the book of Acts in chapter 15 as the gospel is going to go out to the Gentiles because eventually um, the nation would be brought back for the messianic rule. Note, a mere spiritual restoration cannot fulfill this prediction in any meaningful sense of the term. In other words, th there's nothing... Uh, build it as it used to be means that it has to be reconstructed as a nation, not, not, just, um, not just people being saved, but building this nation back uh, because it had fallen down. Micah chapter 4, though, um, <clears throat> again, Micah was preaching to uh, Judah and Benjamin. He still deals with the restoration. And again, this is prior to the Babylonian captivity. He says, I will make the lame a remnant, um, those driven away a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion, talking about Jerusalem, from that day and forever. Obviously, this is not during that time because they were going to go into captivity. As for you, O watchtower of the flock, O stronghold of the daughter of Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to the daughter of Jerusalem. So once again, um, you can see how this necessitates the fact that there would be um, an actual kingdom that is brought back.
Now, if we go into the book of Daniel, in chapter 2, this is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. After speaking of four great successive earthly kingdoms or world governing empires, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and ten kings to come through the revived Roman Empire, Daniel declares that in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to other people. This is a final kingdom on this planet. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Two things stand out. Note, number one, all the references in Daniel 2 and 7 are to an earthly political kingdom. So if you were to read Daniel 7, you see that. Number two, Jesus' use of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew uh, follows Daniel 2, which implies a literal political kingdom. So you can, you know, you can stop the video. You can look up these verses. You can read chapters 2 and 7 of Daniel that discuss the bringing in of this kingdom. It needs to be a physical kingdom. Now, the reason that this is emphasized is because um, today there's a lot of Christians that think that the kingdom has just become a spiritual kingdom, and that is the solution and the end all of whatever God's kingdom is going to be. Uh, and the church is Israel and everything. And it can't be further from the truth. That's nothing of the sort. The Messianic kingdom has not yet fulfilled, uh, was not yet fulfilled when the Old Testament ended. Um, number one, the Old Testament records states no uh, rec, rec the Old Testament records um, can't speak today states no such fulfillment. On the contrary, Jews are still expecting the Messiah right down to the last minute in the Old Testament, anticipated in the last book written, which is Malachi chapter four, anticipating the coming of. Um, the, the Messiah and also of Elijah prior to his arrival. Uh, number two, Daniel chapter nine predicts the Messiah will not die until AD 33, um, uh, which basically is, uh, if you do the calculations from Daniel nine and whether it's AD 33 or 32, uh, depends on whether you uh, adjust it one year or the other. I know Sir Robert Anderson wrote The Coming Prince he adjusts it one year, but be that as it may, um, there's 483 years, you know, when you do this calculation from the time that Nehemiah got the, um, the certification from uh, King Ahasuerus or, or, you know, Artaxerxes Longeminus that he could go back and rebuild Jerusalem till Jesus came into Jerusalem on that donkey. It's uh, 173,880 days. Uh, it needs to be converted, that 483 years, because Daniel worked off a 360-day year calendar. Um, so that's how you get the 173,880 days. So that's how they calculate it. It's 483 years calculated in that way, considering leap years and everything else. But that's how it works out. It's just amazing that it does. Uh, Orthodox Judaism denies the Messianic kingdom has yet arrived. But anyways, the point is, is that there's still an outstanding seven years for the tribulation because the original Daniel 9 prediction is 77 year periods, which is uh, 490 years. So we're seven years short. And that's the outstanding seven years for the tribulation period, which is Revelation chapter 6 through 18. Number four, Jesus said under oath that he was the Messiah. The high priest said, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Number one, yes, uh, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Number two, but I say to you all, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. So uh, Jesus confirmed it with two statements, that he was the Messiah uh, and that he would return. So, um, makes it abundantly clear that the Old Testament had not fulfilled any of the Messianic kingdom predictions. 
Uh, the Messianic kingdom is at hand. It's ready to come. It's at the door in the New Testament. Uh, number one, the angel implied it to Joseph. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. This is when she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Number two. The angels implied it to the shepherds. They said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Um, number three, it was anticipated by the Magi. Um, they said, Where is he who was born? King of the Jews. They were told by the Jewish leaders in Bethlehem of Judea, For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, uh, by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The quotation from uh, Micah 5, 2. Number four, it was celebrated by Mary. Uh, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. He has spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Number five, it was uttered by Zacharias. Uh, this is the father of uh, John the Baptist. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn that is a power and authority of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his prophets, which have been since the world began to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. He's going to fulfill his covenant. He started the prophecies uh, since the world began, basically uh, Genesis 3.15. Uh, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Number six, it was announced by John the Baptist, the herald of the king. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near or at hand. It is ready to come. It is at the door. It was announced by Jesus himself. Uh, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Number eight, it was proclaimed by the twelve apostles. They were commissioned, Do not go among the Gentiles. Obviously, this is to the nation of Israel. This is where the message went. Don't go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And later by the 70 in Luke 10. It's the four times that it, uh, it is mentioned. It was proclaimed by Jesus himself when he announced the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But there is no kingdom without a king. So again, we see all the places that it is um, made abundantly clear that it was at the door ready to be brought in because the king was there, but it just never was because they rejected him. Jesus acknowledged it under oath before Caiaphas. Uh, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I will tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. They didn't like that. It was the accusation on Jesus' cross. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. They didn't like that. Joseph of Arimathea was waiting for the kingdom. Uh, in Luke 23, it says, Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea, he was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. He was anticipating it and waiting for it. Number 13, this messianic kingdom did not appear until John the Baptist offered it, uh, and, uh, which is an interesting uh, point because uh, it, it could not just appear. It had to be announced, and there had to be a king ready to bring it in. The law and the prophets were pro proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, Jesus said. But John died without entering the kingdom. Jesus said, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. 
yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So, uh, because they would be part of this new covenant that he was bringing in. The announced messianic kingdom was identical to the literal political kingdom promised in the Old Testament. So, these two kingdoms are the same. In other words, the, the messianic kingdom Jesus was announcing to come uh, was at hand is the same one as the literal political kingdom in the Old Testament. Number one, this is evident from its announcement, which assumes that the Jewish hearers were expected to know what it meant, namely the kingdom expected in the visible reign of the Messiah on the earth from Jerusalem. Their understanding of what the kingdom was came from the Old Testament. Otherwise, they wouldn't have known what he was even talking about. Number two, Jesus never intimated that his kingdom was any different than the one presented in the Old Testament, but was a fulfillment of it. It wasn't a different kingdom. It was one they were waiting for. Number three, the term Son of Man and Kingdom of Heaven used by Jesus in his teaching on the kingdom are rooted in the Old Testament messianic predictions in Daniel of a literal kingdom on earth. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, um, you know, especially presents that and uh, anticipates it, is prophetic. Number four, Jesus constantly appealed to the literal Old Testament predictions to support his claims to the messianic kingdom. All prophecy is literal. It is not allegorical. Um, you cannot just spiritualize prophecy. You can't allegorize it to mean something that it actually is not because it is based in a literal understanding of Scripture. Jesus understood prophecy literally. The apostles understood prophecy literally. We can't change that. We shouldn't anyways. Number five, the gospel record always connects the kingdom proclaimed by Jesus with that of Old Testament prophecy. Again, you can stop the video and then you can look through these verses. Number six, there is a literal identity with events predicted by the prophets about the Messiah in the life of Christ. For example, he was born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, in the city of Bethlehem, Micah 5, of the tribe of Judah, Matthew 1, 3, and also uh, back in Genesis 49. He performed miracles, Isaiah 35. He made a triumphal entry. Right, Zechariah 9, 9, he died, Isaiah 53, Daniel 9, and was resurrected from the dead, Psalm 16, which Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. Number seven, all the basic elements of the Old Testament prophetic kingdom are found in Christ's message and miracles. A, the spiritual element of repentance. B, the moral element is found in the Sermon on the Mount. C, the social dimension is manifested in his concern for children, widows, and the poor. D, an ecclesiastical element is found in his faithful attendance to the Jewish religion, uh, including its feasts and a, and a regular synagogue attendance. E, the political element uh, in that he would reign over the house of Jacob forever and reign on the throne in Jerusalem and his apostles on the 12 thrones. F, the physical element uh, was present in that all miracles in his life, such as the virgin birth and resurrection, were in the physical world, as were his healings of others. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, A, B, C, D, E, F. Those are the six things that McLean had listed out at the beginning of this uh, subsection here. Uh, if you were to go back and you'll see uh, he talked about the spiritual aspect of the kingdom, um, you know, the, the, the spiritual, I think his list was spiritual, physical, um, uh, social, ecclesiastical, um, and then moral was the last one, I believe. But this is how that it works out uh, in those comparisons. So, number seven, the rejection of the Messianic kingdom. Jesus was obviously rejected. A, the presentation of the Messianic kingdom. B, the rejection of the Messianic kingdom. And C, the postponement of the Messianic kingdom. So we'll look at these three. Number one, the presentation. John the Baptist preached the Messianic kingdom as a future but uh, impending event. 
the, he proclaimed, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand or near, but he died having never seen the kingdom. So John preached that. According to Jesus' model prayer, the kingdom is still future. He asked uh, to pray, our Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Clearly, number one, this was about a kingdom that had not yet come. And number two, one that was not just spiritual, but would yet come on earth. C, Jesus also said, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places in the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. There's a geography to this around the world. Next, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you will have followed me, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. E, he also says, do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Again, this is a physical kingdom. Jesus spoke of it as a future. At the Last Supper, he says, I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. Note, at no time did Jesus and his disciples literally do this. In other words, or hence, one must either give up a consistent literal interpretation of Scripture or else accept that this is a future time. There's no other way to do it. B, the rejection of the Messianic kingdom. Number one, doubts of John the Baptist um, in chapter 11. Uh, the condemnation of their sins in 11, rejection of the religious establishment. This is, these are the chapters in Matthew 12, the mysteries of the kingdom in Matthew 13, the announcing of the church in Matthew 16, the announcing of his death, the same chapter into 17, uh, which is uh, chapter 17 is the uh, transfiguration, instruction for his church in 18, prediction of his coming in 19, prediction of his death in 20, prefiguring his second coming in 21, rejection by Jewish leaders in 22 and 23, and the prediction of the second coming in 24 and 25, the crucifixion of the king of the Jews in 26 and 27. So this is how Matthew lays out, you know, Matthew uh, has a chiastic approach to this, which we're not going to present here, but basically the pivotal point is chapter 12, where he leads up to chapter 12, where Jesus is rejected, and then the, the offer of the kingdom is never given after that. And Matthew 13, the mystery parables, um, some see seven, some see eight parables, not really important. The key is, is that in chapter 13, it describes the interim period between his rejection and his second coming, what it's going to be like. So the apex of rejection, Matthew wrote, when Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles have been performed because they did not repent, Matthew 11, the summit of unbelief was reached when Jesus healed a demon-possessed blind and deaf man. For when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is, not only, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons, to which Jesus replied, and so I tell you that every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. The Holy Spirit was the one doing these works through Jesus, and they were assigning it to the devil. The announcement of a spiritual kingdom. Immediately after his rejection, Jesus announced the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, namely a spiritual kingdom, the uh, interrogum, Inter the in between period uh, between his rejection and his second coming. Um, it is the interim uh, period. Number two, in the wake of this rejection by Israel, Christ announced, I will build my church. Um, obviously, this is after his rejection. It is in the old, it is in the Old Testament, but now revealed to the apostles. So, um, these mysteries were things that were not prophetically anticipated um, 
in the sense that they could not be recognized unless revealed and explained. Number three, when Jesus began to announce his ultimate rejection, namely his death at the hands of the Jewish nation, um, in Matthew 21, he cited, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Uh, number four, Israel will not be restored as a nation after the fullness of the Gentiles is complete. Paul wrote, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, uh, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. So there's the fullness of the Gentiles that actually needs to be accomplished, which uh, God is working at this point in time through the church. So Christ's spiritual reign is in the church, both Jews and Gentiles, right? The phrase kingdom of God is also used of the New Testament church. So um, the church is obviously connected to the kingdom of God. It is not the kingdom of God, uh, but it is, it is uh, an aspect within God's rule. Uh, there's a spiritual aspect where God rules over the people in the church, he is their savior, their Lord. Uh, the church is the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Um, this is revealed by Paul in Colossians and Ephesians, where he discusses this. the church is a mystery. Uh, and this is the kind of mystery aspect of what's going on at this point. In other words, people did not anticipate it. They were looking for the actual physical kingdom to come in with the Messiah, but him being rejected, there is this mystery kingdom that functions now, or the church in that, in that sense. The church began on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, where they were baptized into the spiritual body of Christ. So we see that there. Uh, number four, the people saved in the New Testament times before the day of Pentecost were in the kingdom of God, but not in the church. It's important. Um, the church did not start till Acts 2. Now, the apostles and the believers bridged over from basically the Mosaic covenant into the new covenant. But, um, but the people that died prior to that are not part of the church because the church had its starting point. Again, future anticipated, Matthew 16, Peter said, uh, you know, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus, you know, uh, affirmed all that. And he says, I will build my church, right? So yet future, and then Pentecost was the day that it began, Acts 2. Number five, the kingdom of God is broader than the church because it encompasses more. All who are in the church are in the kingdom of God, but not all in the kingdom of God are in the church. In other words, Old Testament saints and other believers who died before the message of Pentecost came to them. So... Uh, just because they died prior to the church starting does not mean that they're not part of the kingdom of God. Uh, they are in the kingdom of God also. They're just not in the church particularly. So remember, the overall kingdom of God, the universal one, has both saved and unsaved. The spiritual kingdom of God is only the saved. The church is only the saved. And then Israel as a nation bridges both of these. There are saved and unsaved people in the nation of Israel. But once they get saved during this time, they become part of the church, only the saved. When Jesus referred to the secrets of the kingdom in Matthew 13, he was not referring to the covenanted Davidic or millennial kingdom. In other words, when he talked about the spiritual aspects of it, the mystery form, uh, that there would be such a kingdom was no secret in the Old Testament. In other words, it was always known that there would be an actual messianic kingdom. It is clearly revealed the essential features of the characteristics of the millennial kingdom. But what the Old Testament had not revealed was that an entire age would intervene between the offer of the kingdom by the Messiah and Israel's uh, reception of the king and enjoyment of full kingdom blessings. So with this background, we see that the time period covered 
by the parables in Matthew 13 extends from Israel's rejection until its future reception of the Messiah, basically in the millennial reign. This is from uh, Dwight Pentecost's paper at uh, predestrib.org. It's called The Relationship of the Church to the Kingdom of God. So you can go out there and get that and read the entire paper. Um, it's very informative. But um, So obviously there would be no mystery if Jesus is talking about this, you know, the, the secrets of the kingdom or the mystery, like what's what's the mystery? What is the secret? The, the, this should be plainly known because it was anticipated if he was dealing with the physical messianic kingdom. He obviously wasn't because the what was not anticipated prophetically and laid out was that he would be rejected, the church would be started, the church would be ended, and then they would continue on with the program for Israel. Uh, his quote goes on to say, although this period includes the church age, it extends beyond it. For the parables of Matthew 13 precede Pentecost. In other words, the, the, uh, the function of what the Matthew 13 parables explain started prior to Pentecost, obviously at Jesus' rejection. For the parables of Matthew 13 precede Pentecost and extend beyond the rapture. Thus, these parables do not primarily concern the nature, function, and influence of the church. Rather, they show the previously unrevealed form in which God's theocratic rule would be exerted in a previously unrevealed age made necessary by Israel's rejection of Christ, right? So, again, I think it's a good paper, and if you have an opportunity. So here's another picture of the kingdom, just to, you know, the different kingdoms and kind of how they relate together. So the Matthew 13 parables, let's take a quick look. Jesus said the secrets or the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them, the outsiders. The people that believed in him uh, could receive what this kingdom had to, um, or the understanding of it and everything, because he would explain it to them. They had received him. They believed him. The others did not, right? Number one, there's the parable of the sower. It tells us most people will reject the gospel, at least a half, if not three quarters. Um, the wheat and the tares, both believers uh, and mere professors, will continue to grow together. It will be very difficult to know which is which. Uh, the mustard seed, Christendom, which is larger than just the church, it is all that claim to be Christian, will grow abnormally large and rapidly from a tiny beginning. Uh, the yeast parable of the leaven, false teaching will grow. It will spread throughout the whole thing. Uh, we see that abundantly today. The hidden treasure, Christ came to purchase his treasured possession, Israel, which is hidden right now, actually, because of their rejection of Christ, which they'll be picked up later on after the rapture. The pearl, Christ gave his life to provide redemption for the church. And then the harvesters. Uh, the angels will separate the saved from the lost when Christ returns. So that's, um, that is uh, the seven that are listed there, parables. The postponement of the messianic kingdom. In other words, it's delay. It's not canceled, it's just postponed. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable of the minas, uh, which is three months' wage. Uh, because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. But it wasn't. Uh, he had been rejected. Uh, the parable of the talents. Uh, as we look through this in Matthew 19, tells the kingdom between Jesus' two comings. The, I'll never get this word right. Uh, interrogum. Interrogum. I don't know how to pronounce it. I've tried and I've tripped over it. But anyways, it is the interim time. Uh, and first, in the parable, the nobleman, if you read through the parable, the nobleman, who is Christ, goes to a far country, heaven, for two purposes, to receive a kingdom and then to return. Second, there are two classes of people, servants and citizens. Third, each servant accepts an equal amount of money and the duty to invest it until uh, Christ or the nobleman returns. Fourth, the citizens, Israel, context, hated him and uh, repudiated his claims to rule over them. 
Uh, fifth, having received his kingdom, the nobleman Christ will return to earth to reward his servants according to their service in his absence. Sixth, at his return, he will execute judgment on the citizens, Israel, who rejected him. And then seventh, the period of the interim between his two comings is called a long time in a similar parable. So again, this is out of McLean's, uh, the, uh, the greatest of all all the kingdom, um, greatest of the kingdom. So uh, big book, but again, if you're really interested, it's worth getting it. On the postponement, number one, it was not postponed from the standpoint of God. He knew from all eternity that Christ would be rejected. For this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, Put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So Peter says, look, this was no accident. God knew all about this, but uh, God didn't make them do it. They were guilty and responsible uh, for what they did on their own. So likewise, number two, the fullness of the Gentiles, which intervened, was not an afterthought with God. The church was a mystery, right? It wasn't prophesied in that way. Uh, you needed to get it through Revelation. Um, Romans tells us, he, and, and also Ephesians, but eternally known and planned by God, but it was not known in previous times, being only revealed to the apostles and prophets. So again, number three, so the church is parenthetical from the standpoint of national the national history of Israel since God's time clock for Israel as a nation stopped when they rejected their Messiah. So if you look at the prophecies in the Old Testament, it's like the, it's like a prophetic time clock. It's going, going, going. They rejected Christ. It stopped. While it stopped, God is now working in the church, working through the church to reach the world, uh, the bride of Christ, it is a separate group of people. It is not the nation of Israel. It has not replaced the nation of Israel or anything. And then when the church is taken up, that clock starts again during the tribulation period. Number four, but from the standpoint of the eternal plan of God, there is no break in God's plan. The purpose was to provoke the Jews and provide salvation for the Gentiles. So God's just amazing as he does this. So on the one side, he uses Israel's hardened, hardened rejection of Christ. Um, and then in reaching out to the Gentiles, at the same time he's saving Gentiles, uh, he's motivating Israel to jealousy. So uh, that's why Paul gets to the end of Romans 11. He says, you know, this is just too much um, um, that, you know, his his judgments are beyond our finding out. Paul just is is. It blew his mind, and uh, Paul had quite a mind. Note, the Messianic kingdom was not yet fulfilled in the time of the apostles, obviously. Delay was because of Israel's rejection of Christ. Number one, general statements of the rejection. He, Jesus, was in the world, and through the world, uh, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Uh, John chapter 1. Number two, it was accentuated um, by the unpardonable sin of the Jewish leaders who charged that Jesus was doing miracles by the power of the devil, Matthew 12. After his rejection, Jesus declared, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruit. Talking about the Gentiles. Number four, later Jesus said they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will tr be trampled uh, on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Again, um, until the Messiah comes and reigns, Israel will never have their own authority or rule really over themselves. Number five, judicial blindness resulted from Israel's rejection of their Messiah. A, Jesus cites Isaiah 6 in Matthew 13 as predicting it, not determining it. Important distinction. 
Paul explains Israel's unbelief because of the rejection. Number six, the rejection is only temporary until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Number seven, it will end when the church is complete. For Paul said, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. Uh, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. Partial, obviously, because there are Jews in the church until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Um, so, number seven, the fulfillment of the Messianic kingdom. Number one, Jesus predicted it, Peter promised it, and Paul pronounced it, and Paul then predicted it, and John prophesied it. So, number one, Jesus predicted it. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, we at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. Valid question. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons in which I will restore the kingdom to Israel. In other words, that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts or the end of the earth. So, um, they thought uh, they had been listening to him for 40 days. He had been teaching them. Uh, they were gathered together. This is after the resurrection, Acts 1. So all of a sudden, you know, valid question. Okay, so now that, now that you've taught us all this stuff, is it now you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Uh, he didn't say it wasn't going to happen. He said, you know, God the Father, is, he'll deal with the timing of it. Um, but as far as we're concerned, he says, you just have a job to do. You go wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes on you. I may have been teaching you, but you're still not ready. And so that's when the church began. So um, Jesus predicted it. Now notice that, number one, they were not speaking out of ignorance, but had 40 days instruction by Christ himself. Number two, restoration in Acts 1, 6 implies it once existed. It needs to be restored. Number three, Luke 21 states that it is near, but not yet to come. Number four, it will be restored as it was expected in the Old Testament. Number five, Israel is used in the national ethnic sense as it is in the context. Um, what they would normally understand as Israel. They were Israelites, right? Number six, the disciples were, were only ignorant of the time, not the nature of the Messianic kingdom. They understood what it was supposed to be. Uh, they had the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophesied uh, all the characteristics of it. Jesus did not rebuke them about any misunderstanding as he did elsewhere, you know, do not understand. Um, in the interim, uh, they would be occupied with a different task, helping to build Christ's church or spiritual kingdom. Two aspects of the kingdom. There's an inner and an outer aspect. Maybe this will help uh, for some differentiation. Number one, the spiritual aspect is the inner aspect. The outer aspect of the kingdom that is not here is the political aspect. Number two, the mystery resolves around the fact that um, the, the kingdom can only really be seen operating in certain people, but not operating in the world. The outer aspect is the messianic kingdom when it arrives and Jesus reigns over it physically in the world. The inner aspect is present. The outer aspect is future. The inner aspect is the church right now. The outer aspect is the thousand-year reign when Christ comes. So you can look at that and you can see the two, how they differ. Um, the fulfillment, right? Jesus predicted it. Uh, Peter promised it. So Peter, uh, in Acts chapter 3, talking to the Jews, he says, Repent, therefore, and turn again that your sins may be blotted out and the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. He's going to stay there until everything is fulfilled. But he anticipated it. Note first, the Messianic kingdom had not yet been fulfilled in Peter's prophecy. Secondly, there is a yet future time when God will restore the kingdom to Israel. Third, it will not happen until after Jesus returns again. Fourth, there is no hint at any spiritual kingdom had replaced these prophecies. That, that's not the case. Number five, the promises made in the Old Testament were not just for them, but for their 
literal descendants who were heirs of the promises. Number six, these promises are forever, a long time. Seventh, these promises and covenants made by God also included in the unconditional promise to inherit the holy land from Egypt to the Euphrates. This is the unconditional promise ratified into a covenant made with Abraham in Genesis 15. Paul pronounced it, Romans 11. I magnify my ministry, in other words, to the Gentiles, in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, right, all the Gentiles, what will their acceptance mean by the life but life from the dead? They were broken off because of their unbelief. For if God did not spare the natural branches, the Jews, neither will he spare you Gentiles. Paul's dealing with a little bit of a different issue there. And then he says, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted back into the olive branch, olive tree. For if you were cut from that, from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature, Gentiles, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will, the, will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then in this way, all Israel will be saved. So the Jews, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the natural olive tree, the, the foundation for the nation, uh, resulted in ethnic Jews. Okay. Well, if an ethnic Jew believes, Paul is saying, look, right now, we, the Gentiles, us, uh, the church, is abnormal that they're not part of the natural olive tree they are uh, kind of alien branches that are being brought into it by faith same faith as abraham but when all israel then believes in the future at the uh, during the tribulation uh, and then following into the messianic reign in the in chapter 20 of revelation then that is the natural branches. They, they, they should be brought back into it. They, I mean, that is their foundation. They're not only ethnic Jews, but they are also at that point Jews by faith in Christ. Um, Paul said, <clears throat> I, I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So Again, um, Paul is saying, look, obviously God is saving Jews. I'm a Jew. The original church was Jews, so it has nothing to do with that. What then? What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain, but the elect did. For I can testify about them that they are zealous, talking about the Jews for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to, be, and sought to establish their own, that they, they did not submit to God's righteousness. In other words, the Jews are trying to work their way into the kingdom. They're not receiving the uh, imputation or the transfer of righteousness, which is by faith that um, they need to have. Otherwise, they don't have the proper faith to enter God's kingdom. The scope of Israel's rejection, so is seen here. And then the reason for their rejection is seen there in that verse. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? The result of Israel's rejection is salvation to the Gentiles. After all, the bottom paragraph, if you were cut off out of the olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this, my brothers, as we just read again. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in and then all Israel will be saved. The final restoration of Israel as a nation. So we see that here. Note, first, Israel is a nation, though not all individuals in it rejected their Messiah and they there, thereby their promised messianic kingdom. Second, God, whose grace to Israel is 
uh, irrevocable, will fulfill his unconditional promise to Israel. Third, in his mysterious and eternal wisdom, God used Israel's fall for the Gentiles' salvation. Fourth, nonetheless, when God's complete plan of salvation is accomplished, God will restore or re-engraft Israel as a nation and fulfill his unconditional promises to them. Fifth, the Messianic kingdom was delayed but never annulled by Israel's rejection. And sixth, when the Messiah returns and is accepted by the nation of Israel, then all Israel will be saved. This will be the end of the tribulation before the beginning of the millennium. Paul predicted it. Paul wrote, In the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge, he wrote to Timothy. The kingdom is still coming. It is not yet here. Number two, the kingdom will visibly appear. Right? That's what Paul is saying. The Greek word for appear is from uh, epiphania, which in contemporary Jewish literature means a visible manifestation of a hidden divinity. So that's the... Uh, Greek English lexicon, lexicon of the New Texan by uh, Arndt. So uh, it is used of his first coming, which was a literal physical coming. So uh, why would you change it to something else for his second coming? It is also used of his second coming when he comes in judgment. So we see Paul predicted it and John prophesied it in Revelation 20. This is... Um, We've read this a number of times. This talks about the Messianic kingdom and the start and how it's going to go for a thousand years. So with that, um, we have the end of this presentation. I'm sorry it went over time. I tried to move very quickly. There was a lot of slides, but uh, we'll continue on with the next presentation next week. So until then, may God richly bless you as you continue to study his word.